Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Yongsan Baptist Church Sunday School, English Sunday School specifically, December 26th, 2021. Merry Christmas to all those that weren't with us yesterday. You missed a great time. Yeah. Amen. It was a good day. Lots of good food, lots of good fellowship, lots of good people. That's what you need. The last couple of weeks, we've been looking down at the evidence from geology for a biblical flood and how it relates to radiometric dating. And today, we're going to finish this short, serious topic by addressing how the tool of radiometric dating can be useful in creation science. Radiometric dating methods sometimes yield conflicting results, but the technique itself is scientific and reliable. And that's really what we want to push forth here, is that the technique, the tool, is not the problem. It's the interpretation and the assumptions that are the problem. But once the results are inter interpreted in a biblical framework, they do yield clear patterns that help us make better under have a better understanding of Earth's history since creation, which, as we have said many times, is only about 6,000 years ago. Amen? Amen. All right, so we saw last week that the same rocks can yield very different ages, depending on which radiometric dating technique you use. The inconsistent results are due to the problems of inheritance and contamination, as we talked about in, in that, that previous lesson. Which rocks, um, the inheritance and contamination issues cause the rock's chemistry to differ from the assumptions of modern uniformitarianism that would, uh, would make these radioactive clocks work. So we also discussed that new evidence indicates radioactive elements in the rocks, which are used to date the rocks, decayed at a much faster rate during some past event or events in the last 6,000 years. Remember, we talked about the, the crystals that had released helium, measurable at only about 6,000 years, even though the radioactive elements were measuring over a million, billion, gajillion, Googleplex years, right? And then obviously, the, the radioactive decay had to have happened much faster since the helium is a standard observable rate of, of uh, release. So the claimed ages of million, many millions of years, which are based on today's slow decay rates, are totally unreliable. Does this mean that we should throw out radiometric dating altogether and just abandon all forms, including carbon-14? No. Surprisingly, no. They are useful. Um, in some ways. The general principles of radiometric dating and uh, using radioisotopes to date rocks are sound principles. It's just that the assumptions have been wrong and have led to exaggerated dates. So while the clocks cannot yield absolute dates of the rocks, they can provide relative ages that allow us to compare any two rocks or two rock units and know which one formed first. Right? So that's still very useful. Also, they can help us compare rock units in different areas of the world to see which ones formed at the same time. Again, that is useful information. And they also can allow physicists, as they continue to examine the same rocks uh, with different dating methods, they can make new discoveries from those clues about the unusual behavior of radioactive elements in the past. So those are three things that can really uh, key in um, where radiometric data can help us. So with the help of this growing body of information, creation geologists hope to piece together a better understanding of the previous, of the pre sorry, the precise sequence of events in Earth's history from the creation week to the flood and beyond. <clears throat> so different dates for the same rocks is the big problem here. Usually, geologists do not use all four main radioactive clocks to date a rock unit. This is considered an unnecessary waste of time and money. After all, if the clocks really do work, then they should all yield about the same age for the same rock unit, so you shouldn't even worry about it. But <laughs> if they don't work, then they're going to yield different dates or and vice versa. Sometimes, though, using different parent radioisotopes to date different samples or minerals from the same rock unit yield vastly different ages, as we saw last week, and that hints that something is amiss. So recently, creationist researchers 
have utilized all four common radiometric isotope um, uh, clocks. Where we talk about uranium has two, then potassium, rubidium, and samarium, right? They've used all four of them to take the same rock units, and among those rock units uh, that they tested, they're, they chose ones that were far down in the Grand Canyon, right? That were down below the upper sedimentary rocks that we've studied in our previous lessons. They were down here in these twisted uh, basement rocks and um, uh, great unconformity areas. So those four that were chosen are char the, they're chosen because they are well-known sections of rock and they are very well characterized. So that they've been studied quite a bit and so that's why the creationist researchers chose these because they are, they're not obscure where somebody could claim that they're, they're just you know off on unstudiable areas. Um, I know this is a lot of a single graphic. It's actually in your handout on the second page if you want to look at it. But we're going to be a little bit closer for you. So choosing these four, they chose the Cardenas Basalt, that's the uppermost here, which is lava flows that are deep in the East Canyon sequence. Then they chose the Bass Rapids Diabase Sill, that's the next one down right here, where basalt magma squeezed between layers and then cooled. Then they chose here the Brahma Amphibolites, which is basalt lava flows deep in the canyon sequence that later metamorphosed. So it's it was um, excuse me basalt that became metamorphic. Then the Elvis Chasm granodiorite. I'll say that right one of these times. Which is granite that is regarded as the oldest canyon rock unit. So that is a basement rock that's regarded as the oldest rock unit of the Grand Canyon. So those four are the ones they chose to test. The table that's at the bottom here, and also in your notes, lists, we'll zoom in on it. There we go. So the table lists out the dates obtained from each rock unit by each testing method. And then this graph, go ahead, maybe. This graph puts, plots it out. Right, by each of the different sequences they tested and its radiometric decay um, numbers by which type of testing and then what date aligned with those types of testing. So it's immediately apparent by this data, right, which is again hard to see, but it's in the notes, I can send it to you if you want. The, the data that has been, has been shown here um, immediately shows each rock unit does not agree in age. There, none of these numbers match within a, an acceptable standard deviation. So, it, the, in, if we looked at the first one, right, the Cardenas basalt has a samarium neodymium age that's three times the potassium argon age of the same rock unit. And that's a vast difference. That, way too different to be. So, so nevertheless, the ages do follow three obvious patterns. Even though the numbers are completely off, they follow patterns, and the patterns are what's important to us. So two of the techniques, the potassium argon age here, and the rubidium strontium age here, always yield younger ages than the other two techniques, the uranium lead and the samarium uh, neodymium. So, oh, <laughs> And the, there's no U, there are no A there in the Samaria. It's funny. The technology, I'll tell you. Um, they always yield younger dates than the other two. Furthermore, the potassium argon ages are always younger than the rubidium strontium ages. So these, well, these ages always younger than these ages, and both of these always yielding younger ages than these. We see a pattern. Um, often the Samaria neodymium ages are younger than the uranium lead ages. So they're not necessarily in age order here. If these two were flipped, they would be. But the recognizing those patterns, we want, want to find out what do they mean, right? So all the radioactive clocks in each rock unit should, according to evolutionary thought, should have started ticking at the same time, which means the instant that the rock was formed, the radioactive decay should have started. So how do we explain that they're so vastly different in these ages of the same rock unit, but with different radioactive decay um, clocks being tested. So the answer is simple, but profound. Each of these radioactive elements must have decayed at different 
faster rates in the past. Okay, so in the case of the Cardenas basalt, that's the first one on the list, while the potassium argon clock clicked through about 516 million years, two of the other clocks ticked through 1111 million years, which is, by the way, 1.1 billion years, um, and 1588 million years. We're just talking in millions of years because that's the uh, common unit here for uh, that it's denoted in. So uh, that's quite a bit of difference, and these clocks ticked at such different rates, not only not, the fact that they click at the different rates does not only show that they are inaccurate, but that these rocks may not be millions of years old if there's such a great difference between them. If we're talking about a plus or minus from 516 to 1500, right, we're talking about a plus or minus 300 times. So if you, if you go minus 300 times from 516 million years, right, that's a whole lot fewer years than, I mean, that's a big gap. Almost a, almost a, a billion years difference a billion years before it, it never even happened. It hasn't happened yet, all right? So it's, it, it's, a, it's silly math. But how could you use, how could the radioactive K rates have been different in the past? If we observed them for the last however many thousands of years we've been able to reserve, observe this stuff, I don't even think we've been doing this a thousand years yet. But if, we, if what we've observed is this continuous steady pace, how could they have um, had a different pace in the past? And that is a good question. <laughs> Where cre creation researchers don't fully understand yet. However, the observed age patterns do provide clues. Again, clues give us information, and data is how we do science. The fact that the two that are younger ages, potassium argon and rubidium strontium, remember we talked about the different, there are three different ways that radioactive elements decay, right? Alpha, beta, and gamma, right? Gamma gives off photon rays, beta gives off electrons to stabilize, and alpha gives off alpha particles or smaller elements in the form of protons and neutrons in order to stabilize that element, right? And the, an example we showed, helium was the element, that, the alpha particle that was being given off in alpha decay, right? And so, because we, we, we have the difference of alpha decay, beta decay, and gamma decay, these two that, are, that give younger dates are um, beta decay, which means shedding of electrons. So these, you see them in red here, potassium argon dates and rubidium strontium dates that are to the left in all cases. There are younger dates in all cases, and they are beta decay um, situations. That, and then the ones that are longer are alpha decay. And so we can see now that pattern that the beta decay gives younger dates than alpha decay. So the two beta decay elements potassium and rubidium also have themselves younger ages. But we see another pattern within the beta decay that potassium today decays faster than rubidium does, and it always gives a younger age. And so the, in, the, in the case where we have a potassium argon date, the potassium argon date is younger than the rubidium strontium date. So again, recognizing that pattern, what do we do with it? Um, both suggests something happened in the past inside the nuclei of the parent atoms, potassium, rubidium, uh, uranium, and samarium, uh, to accelerate their decay. The decay rate varied based on the stability or instability of the parent atoms. The more unstable, the faster the decay rate. Research continues as it could, or as it should, because the science has never settled. Yes, I said that. And what it does, again, is it gives us more, some, more things to study, more data, and it is intriguing to see those patterns. So what do we do with them then? Because we're looking at this from a concept of relative ages, right? We can't look at it as absolute ages. We need to look at it as relative ages. So let's look again at this chart. And this diagram shows the rock layers, right, within the Grand Canyon that we're talking about. And the, the rock units deeper in the inner gorge along the Colorado River uh, are both listed here, right? So the, the radiometric dating methods accurately show that the top layer, the uh, Cardenas basalt, is younger, laid down later than the ones at the bottom. And that's logical because the sediment making up the layer deposited on top of the other rocks, it would have to have been set down later, radioactive decay started later. So the layers below are older 
than the layers above. That's always going to happen, whether you think in evolutionary timelines or in creation timelines. The ones on top should be younger than the ones on bottom. Uh, but reading the diagram can help us with some other basic information about these rock layers and how they were formed relative to other layers. Based on the radioactive clocks, we can conclude that these four deep rock units in the gourds are all older in a relative sense than the flat sedimentary layers on the top. Um, conventionally, the lowermost or oldest of the horizontal sedimentary layers is labeled early to mid Cambrian, right, in the ages of the evolutionary uh, geologic column. And thus, they're regarded as about 510 to 520 million years old, right? That's the, that's the last um, horizontal sedimentary layer at the top. Um, and all of the rock layers dated older than that, that we see below this, okay? That means that all of them are considered pre-Cambrian, right? That's the only other term within the rock layer. Once you get to Cam the Cambrian layer, uh, era, the, before that, the below that is pre-Cambrian. So apart from the potassium argon date of the Catarina's basalt, right, that yielded a 516 plus or minus 30, apart from that, all of them have correctly shown that the, the four rock units below are formed earlier than Cambrian, that, that's the, the, the lowest horizontal one, so they are all pre-Cambrian. But the passage of time, from our point of view, um, from our worldview, between the pre-Cambrian rock units and the horizontal sedimentary layers was a maximum of 1,700 years. And that's the time between creation, right, and the flood. Whereas these rocks could have been created in the creative power of the world, and these rocks could have been laid down in the sediment of the flood, while these just got moved, and that's why they're crooked, right? That is a theory, that is a possibility. But that, that there's no room for millions of years, no. right? There's only room for up to maybe 1,700 years. All right. Similarly, in a relative sense, the Brahma amphib amphibolites and the Elvis chasm gran granodiorite, these bottom two, right, the basement stones, um, are older, we could say in a matter of days or hours, than these other two, right? Maybe, maybe hours. Um, because of just the fact that they're below them, they may have, in the creation, they may have been laid down this after this, okay? The way that things cooled and created uh, in, in the creation week. So, because we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. I'm gonna stop diverging on the rabbit trails. Um, <laughs> when they, why then should we, this is a question, why then should we expect the radioactive clocks to yield relative ages that follow a logic pattern, a logical pattern, instead of just being equal or being chaotic. Because the younger sedimentary layers up here also yield the same pattern, generally. A lot younger dates, right? But those rocks, I mean, there are a few outliers. There are always outliers in, in, in testing. But generally, they follow the same trend, where the ones that are lower yield older ages than the ones that are higher. So the relative age construct is still there. The, again, um, the answer is simple but profound. The radioactive clocks in the rock units at the bottom of the Grand Canyon that we just showed formed during the creation week, and those rocks clocks have been ticking for longer than the ones that were formed during the flood. Um, and so then you have younger sedimentary layers that are on top of older basement bedstone rocks, right? They were formed during, and then all of it was moved around during the flood. Okay, so let's sum it up. Although it is a mistake to accept radioactive dates of millions of years, the clocks themselves can still be useful in principle to date the relative sequence of rocks formations around the world and during Earth's history. So the different clocks have tipped at different faster rates in the past, as we showed between creation and uh, the flood, and there was Remember back to the first couple of weeks, I used a term that there were two, there were two laws, um, two powers, right, that God exercised relative to his creation. There's the power he used to make everything, and the power he uses to maintain everything, right? And we have to make sure that we remember that those two are separate, because the laws of nature that apply to the maintenance of 
of the creation don't necessarily apply to the week of creation. Because the power that he used in speaking everything into existence, he doesn't necessarily use that now, right? Because of the maintenance of everything that he's... So his, his, his power is still there in maintaining life in the cycle that he has created. But his creative power was a lot different, a lot more power, a lot, a lot different laws and restrictions when he was building those laws out in the first place, right? So we have to separate creation week from the natural laws we observe in nature now. And then that understanding allows us to see that what we see now, observable science now, doesn't necessarily give us any clue about origin science, right? Origin science and observable science, right? And that's the biggest um, sort of refutation against uniformitarian ideology of evolution is they're trying to say their assumption is there is no God, there was no creation, right? So everything continues as it was since the beginning, right? And just like Peter wrote, right? So that, that thought of continuing as it was since the beginning is not necessarily true because we know there were at least two points where everything didn't happen as it had since the beginning. In the beginning, God used immeasurable, unattainable, unimaginable power to speak everything into existence. Right? And that was the week of creation. And then his creation was to continue forever. And then he had to judge his creation. And the flood was also immeasurable power, right? In judgment to destroy what he had made because man had destroyed his plan with our sin. And we can see that in Genesis chapter 1 compared to Genesis chapter 7, where Genesis chapter 1 gets all the way to the point of talking about the earth and us looking down in verse 9 of chapter 1 we read and God said let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear and it was so and God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas and God saw that it was good and it was good until man sinned and then it wasn't good anymore in chapter 7 the global cataclysmic catastrophic flood starting in verse 11 we read the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights and the waters increased and bare up the ark and it was lifted up above the earth and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered and the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days both creation and the flood were events of unimaginable and immeasurable power. But in the beginning, God spoke everything into existence, created the heavens, the earth, the seas, and all that in them is. And then less than a thousand years later, because of our sin, because of man's sin, and destroying what was previously good, God had destroyed the earth that he had made. But what we have to see here, between Genesis 1 and Genesis 7, Genesis 1 to 11 is a great beginning to the Bible. It's, there's a reason it's the beginning of the Bible. Because everything that we have in the rest of the Bible is founded in Genesis 1-11. through 11. And what we can see from this, what we have to see from this in our study of biblical creation is that the decision that God made to destroy everything, in that moment, he exercised a degree of restraint that he didn't have to. Because the God who spoke everything into existence from nothing could just as easily have spoken it out of existence because of Adam's sin and he would have been justified in his decision and instead he sent the destruction of the flood as a reminder but left unto himself a remnant and a way of redemption and that lesson is from Genesis to Revelation that God leaves unto himself a remnant and a way of redemption and that is a wonderful reminder out of rocks <laughs> and, and dating methods. It's a wonderful reminder this Christmas weekend of an unspeakable gift of God through his grace and mercy. Amen? Amen. I hope that radiometric dating is a little less scary, a little less unknowable <laughs> now. And uh, well, I think I have one more topic I want to cover when it comes to uh, geology before we move on. I think I want to look at ice ages and uh, the concept of, you know, are they real? Did they happen? Was there more than one? Where would they might have come from? And uh, because that is, again, something that we can look down at and see 
uh, to get data about what has happened to the earth and how does that fit into the Bible, right? So that might be the last thing we do before we move on to the next next set of lessons. And, uh, well, let's pray and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get to the service. All right, Lord God, we thank you so much for the day that you've given us. We thank you for uh, the ability to learn. We thank you for the ability to study, to show ourselves approved. Lord, we thank you 